You're watching a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Starting in the late 1870s, cattle arrived on the western grasslands of Dakota Territory. They came from Texas by the thousands, but they didn't get here on their own. Men on horses rode with the herds, guiding them to good grazing land. These men were cowboys of the open range. The open range meant miles and miles of public land for cattle to graze, without fences. Very few women helped move the herds up the plains, although they built ranches, owned cattle, and helped make Western culture popular worldwide. Here's how a typical cowboy day started, before sunrise in the summer, according to Earl Knepper, a South Dakota cowboy of the 1890s. Well, we got up real early. One of the boys on the last guard, he comes into camp at about 3.30 in the morning, and he wakes up the cook, if the cook isn't already up and the cook gets breakfast and calls the boys. We had sourdough biscuits. Boy, those big old biscuits. And there was always dried fruit and prunes and plenty of coffee. And we had bacon and ham and sometimes fresh beef. By around 4.30, breakfast is over. The boys have their beds all rolled and the wagons and everybody are all set to go. And any cowboy who couldn't get his bed rolled up in time and get everything ready was called a drag. A cowboy's mornings and evenings would have been pretty sorry without the cook and his chuck wagon. The chuck wagon meant a kind of home for the cowboys. It carried all the supplies necessary for living with a few comforts, a hot, fresh cooked meal, and a blanket or two to keep warm. The cook had everything he needed in that wagon. He even had a table to roll out dough for biscuits. There were plenty of drawers in the chuck wagon full of plates, cups, knives, forks, coffee, cans of sugar, salt, and lots of molasses, which the cowboys called lick. A water keg was hitched to the side of the wagon. When cowboys wanted beef for supper, they usually chose a yearling and killed it in the late afternoon. When it was time to eat, the cook would yell, Chuck, or Chuck away. And sometimes, Come and get it, or I throw it out. Everybody had to follow the cook's rules, even the boss. Pindle <laughs> beans and bread again. You know, I like punching cows, but I'd sure like to work on a ranch sometime where they gave you a steak at night. Boy, a steak would taste good. Mm. Cowboys knew not to ride their horses near the chuck wagon while the cook was preparing food because they might kick up dust. Anyone who made that mistake could expect a serious tongue lashing. Cowboys didn't want dust in their food, even though they themselves were usually covered in it. They were with the herds night and day and didn't change clothes since most only brought the clothes on their back. When they wanted a bath, they found the nearest river. Cowboys often slept under the stars with their hats and boots for pillows. For entertainment, they invented a style of music that remains popular today. Where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the skies are not cloudy all day. Home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. Cowboys who drove cattle up from Texas followed the Northern Trail, which led them to Wyoming, Montana, and Dakota Territory. 
Why go to all the trouble of driving thousands of cattle hundreds of miles from Texas? Grass, water, and markets for beef. Dakota Territory had some of the best grass in the country for grazing cattle. Short grasses like wheatgrass and grama were nutritious for cows and helped fatten them. Cattlemen, the owners of cattle, knew they would get a better price at market for cows that grazed for two or three years in western Dakota Territory. The grasses here usually survived drought and did not easily die during winter. Instead of freezing and drooping to the ground, the grass stems stood up through the snow so that cattle could continue grazing. A cowboy looking at land for his boss in Scotland said, My mouth waters when I think of the feed in that region. The bottom lands of the Belfouche had grass three feet high, although it was November. Cowboys always knew where to find the nearest water. This part of the country had streams and rivers running into the Missouri. The Belfouche, Cheyenne, Grand, Bad, White, and Moreau were all good sources of water for cattle. About markets for beef, trains carried cattle to distant cities for slaughter. For a while, Belfouche ranked as the world's busiest cattle shipping rail yard. And cattlemen knew there were people who wanted beef right in South Dakota. Soldiers stationed at military posts in Dakota Territory, miners in the Black Hills, and residents in new towns springing up across the prairie all ate beef. American Indians on reservations were guaranteed food as part of treaty agreements. Some cattle owners lived far away in places like France, Scotland, and England. Some lived in Dakota Territory. Modern South Dakotans might recognize their names. That's because towns were named for them. Philip, Lemon, and Murdo. Ed Lemon was foreman of the Flying V Cattle Company. James Scotty Philip ran cattle and was also known for his part in saving bison. Murdo McKenzie was one of those from far away, from Scotland. These were boss men to the cowboys. For bosses, as big as Western Dakota was, there was a time when it didn't seem big enough. Cattlemen wanted more land so they could run even bigger herds. They pressured the government to break up the Great Sioux Reservation, and they didn't like sharing the land with buffalo or sheep. This time during the 1880s was called the Bonanza, with many big cattle companies making profits in Dakota Territory. Something that impressed cowboys and their bosses was how healthy cows were in winter, as they grazed on grass sticking through the snow. Because of the snow, they didn't inhale much dust. But then came winters that weren't healthy, and in fact, turned into killers. Some cowboys thought the snow would never get deep enough to prevent cattle from grazing. The terrible winters of 1886, 1887, and 1888 proved them wrong. Blizzards and sub-zero temperatures continued for days. Cattle died and cattlemen lost money. Many cattlemen went broke and returned to Texas. Those who stayed knew they would have to do things differently if they wanted their cattle and businesses to survive. First, they would need to start cutting hay and storing it for their cattle to help them get through tough winters. Also, herds would have to be smaller. The time of the open range was ending and the era of ranching was beginning. A ranch meant land owned by an individual, closed off by fence boundaries. Instead of sleeping under the stars, cowboys now lived in bunkhouses. Some cowboys found themselves working hard in a different way. As ranch hands, they began a great building project, fencing the Western Plains. Before the invention of barbed wire, it simply wasn't possible to put up much fencing on the plains. There were not enough trees to build fences out of wood. All that changed in 1874, when Joseph Glidden developed a machine to produce barbed wire. Now, ranchers could enclose many square miles. Ranch cowboys strung this devil's rope, as it was sometimes called, along wooden posts. They used spades and post hole diggers to plant the posts securely in the ground. They worked hard after putting the fence up to keep it up. 
Cattle often knocked areas of the fence down. Ranch cowboys kept cattle alive during winter by riding long distances to bring them hay. Sometimes ranch cowboys had to respond to emergencies, like cows stuck in snowbanks. Cap Mossman was owner of the Diamond A Ranch. The Diamond A was spread out over half a million acres on the Cheyenne River Reservation. Cap's cowboys built 60 miles of fence to separate his cattle from Murdo McKenzie's. But before fencing was completed, there was one last big roundup on the open range in 1902. Roundups were when cowboys from different cattle companies worked together to find and gather up several thousand head of cattle from each company. As cattle grazed on the open range during the year, one company's herd got mixed with another. During the roundup, cowboys needed a way to tell who owned which cattle. Brands were the answer. A brand was a mark burned onto the height of the animal. Brands could be made up in any shape. They were often letters, numbers, crosses, diamonds, or some combination of those things. I was hanging around town just to spend my time. I was out of a job not making a dime. When a stranger steps up and he says, I suppose that you're a bronc buster by the looks of your clothes. On the roundup, a cowboy called the Nighthawk was responsible for taking care of the cowboy's horses at night, and a wrangler cared for the horses during the day. Cowboys had to do so much riding that one horse wouldn't have been strong enough to endure it. Each cowboy had six to ten horses. The Nighthawk sometimes had to take care of over 200 horses. In fact, so many horses were necessary for running cattle companies that some people developed separate ranches just for breeding and training horses. The purpose of a roundup was to search every draw, coulee, and creek in the area until all cows were in. Cowboys told time by the sun, not a clock. And when the sun sat low on the horizon, they rode back to camp for the night. The 1902 Cowboys probably knew this was the last big roundup they would work. As the times changed, some Cowboys decided to look for different jobs altogether. Whatever they did, though, the 1902 Roundup Cowboys never forgot who they were. They enjoyed reunions the rest of their lives. More than a hundred years later... We're over in six with a tremendous amount of cash in the Copenhagen Cup. He was 88 awesome points. We haven't forgotten them either or any of the other cowboys of the open range. For additional information, a teacher's guide, games, quizzes, and more, log on to dakotapathways.org.